Hey, welcome in, join us. If you like announcements, boy, do we got a Sunday for you. Glad you are here. Um, our giving stations is in, are in the front and in the back as you head on out. How many of you were excited to see the sanctuaries you came in this morning? Sure, appreciate you. Uh, the flags remind us that missions conference is coming first Sunday in October. October 6th is our annual missions conference. Um, there's also a meal that Sunday. So if you enjoyed um, the church picnic last week, let's be honest, that was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Bless my heart to see at 3 o'clock Daddy Berkheimer throw in uh, cornhole. Um, we will uh, have another meal on the 6th. A couple of things coming up. Um, first off, uh, tonight, um, we are having an open house, Charlotte and I, at our new place, 4440 Davidsburg Road. It's a drop-in, 5.30 to 8. We'll have some desserts for y'all. Um, we could probably park about 15 at our spot. So come see our house, enjoy with us. Um, next Sunday, youth group is starting up, uh, 6.30 upstairs in the youth room. Um, Coming up in a couple of weeks, if you liked our uh, summer barbecues, we have a fall one coming up, the 28th at the King's House. Um, there are some more details in your bulletin. Thank you, Steve. Uh, appreciate you for that. And I believe there's a sign-up sheet in the back as well. One more, because we just want to get all the announcements in this morning. Um, for the past five years, we've been uh, partnering with New Hope. We've been packing... Uh, backpacks full of food for the kids in the Dover school system. Um, we do so the last Wednesday of the month. Going to start back up in October, um, 10 o'clock last Wednesday. If you're interested in being part of our team, usually have about four or five people go to New Hope, pack somewhere between 100 and 125 backpacks. Takes us about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. Um, if you're interested, let me know. Um, I'll give you some more information. Um, we do have to make sure we, you have your background checks and get you in the New Hope system. Um, but that's a really awesome way to give back and to make an impact here in Dover. Again, if you're interested, you can let me know about that as well. There are even more announcements than this, believe it or not. That's why you have a bulletin. You can take everything home. You can read it along. I'm going to invite Shaw to come on up, uh, pray for us. We'll begin singing in a moment. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you that we can praise you today, Lord, that you've brought us here safely and that we can hear from your word and fellowship with one another. Lord, we're thankful for our picnic we had last week and future fellowship opportunities that are planned as well. And Lord, we just pray that you will help us to calm our hearts today, that you will help us to hear your word afresh and new, and maybe even in a way that we've never heard it before, Lord, so that we can, um, we can just follow you afresh this week and take the opportunities that you give us as they come our way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand as you are able as we begin with, Whom Shall I Fear?
administration meeting this morning. Our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you, that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord even on, of the Sabbath. Please stand as you are able as we continue with Standing on the Promises.
In six days, God created the heavens and the earth, life and everything else. And on the seventh day, he rested. Work and rest, a sacred rhythm built into the fabric of creation. This day of rest is called the Sabbath. It's a command given to us from God to take one day of the week to stop, rest, and delight in the Lord. It's a nearly forgotten practice that goes against the very grain of our society. With so much emphasis on productivity and achievement, it seems crazy to stop. Why would God ask us to do this? It's because we are limited people. God never meant for us to be defined by our work. We are his children, made in his image, and the Sabbath reminds us of who we are. Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's a reminder that we are no longer slaves. We have been delivered from bondage by the blood of Jesus, and that's why we can be truly content. So on the Sabbath day, we stop. We put down our work, realizing that it does not define us. We rest. We allow our minds, bodies, and souls to slow down. We delight. We enjoy God, our families, creation, and all the good things that God has given us. The Sabbath is a gift given to us by God, to us for our good. So today, let go of your striving and receive the gift of Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days we work, but on the Sabbath day we rest. It's a reminder that we are more than the works of our hands. This time of rest isn't a time of laziness, but it's a time to reflect on who God is and how our relationship with God is doing. We desire to love the Lord of God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and also to love our neighbor as we love, our, as we love ourselves. So the Christian life is, how do we love God and how do we show God's love to others? And in the busyness of life and the craziness of what we do and all the deadlines and all the schedules and all the things that we have to get done, this is a time to rest. This, this hour is a time to rest and reflect and remember that the Lord is God, that he made us and that he has a purpose for our life. So we're going to start this morning with how do I know Jesus? How is my walk with Jesus going this day? And hopefully that you find a moment of rest and reflection here in this place. We're going to take a moment. We're going to pray. And we got a fun Bible study to go through this morning. God, thank you for your good. Your mercy is amazing in our life. God, allow us to rest in you, to rest in this moment, to reflect on who you are and what you would have for us here in this place. God, speak to us through your word in this message we ask. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Butch, a couple minutes ago, read from Matthew chapter 12. I invite you to turn there with us. If you want to take some notes, um, there's always a blank insert. Uh, an outline gives you an idea of where we're going. This idea of Sabbath, we're going to cover over the next two Sundays, this week and next week. It says, at that time, if you've been with us, Jesus called his disciples, he taught his disciples, and in chapter 10, he sent out his disciples. That we're not supposed to be just hearers, but we're supposed to be doers, and he sent them out to the, the lost cities of Israel. In, in chapter 11, he deals with the Pharisees, he also answers a question from John the Baptist, but now the disciples are back. The band's back together, and at that time, they went through the green fields on the Sabbath. The disciples were hungry. He began to pluck the heads of grain, 
may be on the eat. Got two questions when I read this. So they're walking through someone else's field and they're hungry, so they decide just to grab a snack on the way through. Now, my inner city upbringing goes something like, are they stealing someone else's stuff? Like, is that okay? Like, are they allowed just to pass through and grab a snack as they go? Isn't that someone else's field? Aren't they someone else's crops? Isn't that someone else's livelihood? I mean, if you stop and think about it, they're passing through, that's not their field. But they're just going ahead and plucking and eating away. How many of you ever think that question? A little bit of a head scratcher. Again, in America, you might get shot for something less than that, right? Let's be honest, right? Maybe some buckshot, I'm just being honest. Two things about the Old Testament law where this is okay. Right? So um, God gave Israel the law. And in that is some built-in ways to love your neighbor. So this is okay under two conditions. One, that when you come to your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you should not use a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. So if you're passing through and you're grabbing a snack, that's fine, but don't bring your farm equipment here and think you're going to start harvesting someone else's field. Does that make sense? So number one, it's okay if you're doing it by hand, not with farm equipment. And number two, it's okay as long as the farmer went through first. So what would happen was a, a farmer would go through, and they're only allowed to go through and harvest once. And everything they harvest, they keep, but everything that's left behind is for the poor. So in Bible times, there's no food stamps or, or government programs. If you were poor and you needed something to eat, Food was readily available as long as you went out and worked for it. And you see this example in the book of Ruth. Ruth comes back to Israel with her mother-in-law, Naomi, and they're poor. And they don't have anything. So Ruth goes into the fields behind the harvesters and is able to gather up the grain so her and her mother-in-law have some food to live on. And we see the blessing of Boaz making it really easy for her to, to gather, that she would gather as much as a normal um, farmhand during the first day. So the idea that Jesus, with his disciples, is going through the fields and doing this isn't a sign of great wealth on their part, but actually a sign that they had need. So minding their own business, everyone comes back, they're all hungry, they go through the field, they're getting a snack on a Sunday morning or a Sabbath morning. And as they're doing this, the Pharisees, they saw it. You get the idea they're doing one of these, right? And they say, look, your disciples, they're working. They're doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. They're breaking one of the big ten. Right? One of those commandments we have the kids memorize in Sunday school. Remember, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you work, but on the seventh day is a day of rest. Right? The idea of remember, it's a day of reflection. It's a day of realigning our hearts to the things of God. And really the, the key idea here is what does it mean to work? Because the, the accusation is, look, Jesus, you're teaching your, your disciples to work on the Sabbath, and God says that's not lawful. Now, the Pharisees, they love to define things. They love to make rules. In, in the writings of the Pharisees, which is called the Mishnah, they came up with, wait for it, 39 different areas which they defined work. For example... They had specific rules on sowing, plowing, reaping, binding sheets, threshing, winnowing, selecting, grinding, sifting, kneading, baking, and 25 other areas. These sound like some fun people, don't they? Let's go down another level. So when the disciples are getting a snack on the Sabbath, this is what they're really saying. Ready? Ready? According to the Pharisees, plucking the wheat from its stem is reaping, 
rubbing the head between one's palms is threshing, and blowing away the chaff is winnowing. You start scratching your head like, wait a minute. They're just getting a snack, and you're saying they're doing all these things that are wrong. It's crazy, isn't it? Put it let's, put it in, let's put it in modern terms. It would be like making a s'more, right? You're getting the marshmallow out, you're, you're roasting the marshmallow, you're combining it into a sandwich. It would be like having a s'more be work. And you're like, I'm not working, I'm just getting a snack. You're like, y'all are crazy, aren't you? But this is the accusation, this is the finger pointing. They're going, you're sinning. Look at all these bad things you're teaching your disciples to do, and you want all the people to follow. And you take a step back, and you're like, wait a minute. The command is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and you got all these rules for, for making s'mores, roasting marshmallows, and you're like, y'all are nuts, aren't you? Let's make it a little personal. How many times have you heard churches fight and you thought in your heart, man, y'all are nuts, aren't you? How many of you ever heard churches that split over the type of hymnal they use? You're like, man, you're just trying to sing praises to God. Y'all are nuts. I, I was part of a church that before I got there, they split over the color of the carpet. Someone made a big donation, thought green carpet would go nice in the sanctuary, but someone else said, no, 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 green's the color of money. You can't have green in the sanctuary. And they split over the color of carpet. And you're like, y'all are nuts, right? And sometimes we fight over the silliest things. You know, I always say the best Bible is an open Bible. You have one translation, someone has another translation. You're reading God's word. It's a blessing to you. That should be the most important thing, right? And sometimes we make not the main thing the main thing. We make all these other things in the big pickles, don't we? What's the main thing? Remember the Sabbath day to keep you holy. Look, you're more than the work of your hands. So in the craziness of life, we need to take time to, to rest, to realign our hearts, to reflect on the goodness of God. And these fun guys are like... So Jesus responds, and, and really his response in our second point is it's this teaching moment. Because <coughs> Jesus doesn't really ever respond with a yes or a no, but he gives two illustrations. Uh, if you come on Wednesday night going through 1 Samuel, we, we just actually went through this one not too long ago. Jesus says, well, what about David when he was hungry? When he's running from Saul. And when we looked at this, he's not at a great place. He's actually at a really low place. But he goes to the temple and he lies to the priests. And he says he's hungry, he's on a secret mission for Saul, and he's really running from Saul. And, and the priest doesn't have anything to give him but the show bread. The holy bread, the, the priest, the, the bread that's reserved for the priest. But the priest sees David's in a pickle and he's, he's, he's starving and he says, you know what, the only thing I got is this show bread, why don't you take that? It's interesting, the priest doesn't say, well, David, if you come back tomorrow when it's not on the altar, then I can help you out. The idea is preserving life and loving other people is the most important. Right? The Pharisees would rather the disciples go, hey, you're starving, but if you come back tomorrow, you can have all the food you want. You just got to make it to tomorrow. We would be like, no, you, you got this food. The, the most loving thing I can do is share it with other people, right? You know, don't let the, the rules, the laws get in the way of loving other people. He also says, have you not read that on the Sabbath, the priests profane, uh, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath. Are you blameless? Okay. What's the idea of the priests on the Sabbath? Y'all show up and, and people serve one another. 
Imagine coming to church on a Sunday and going, hey, this is the, this is the day of rest. I can't work today. Y'all come back tomorrow. If you come back tomorrow, we can have a great Monday church service, but we can't do church on Sundays. That would be crazy, wouldn't it? You go to the, the temple or the tabernacle on the Sabbath, right? The priests are there. They're serving. They're working. Some of you would say, that's the only day I work. I get it. Um, nothing. Thank you, Terry. A little smirk. I appreciate it. Um, but if you think about it, there's a lot of people who serve on Sundays here, right? you got the worship team who do a great job. You have the, the sound people. You know, our nursery workers are here early Sunday mornings, you know, taking care of the kids and, and junior church, uh, taking care of the bigger kids, right? Also, that you have a place to come in to reflect and, and have a moment of quiet before God. And we don't point fingers at the nursery workers like, how dare you watch the kids on Sunday mornings? Some of you are like, Man, I'm glad they watch the kids, because I'd be watching that little one, googly guys, googly eyes, and that's a lot more entertaining than me up here, right? Some of you are like, man, I'm glad they take the junior church kids upstairs. They give them sh sugar in Sunday school, and now they got a place upstairs to go run up some of that sugar. By the way, our Sunday school teachers, they, they do a great job Sunday morning. I, I'm going to forget some people. we got greeters who serve, right? No one points a finger like, hey, how dare you pass out a bulletin on a Sunday? Or how dare you, there's a, a new person who shows up and you, you take them to the nursery, right? We don't point fingers at, at people who serve on Sundays. So it's like, hey, you're allowed to do this, but you're not allowed to do this. And that's not the real point of the commandment anyway. I mean, how does it start off? It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The idea of remembering is a time of reflection, is a time of realigning your hearts to the things of God. Because if we're honest, this world's crazy, and it's noisy, and it's busy, and it, everything else is pulling your heart in different ways. And hopefully when you come here, you're able to, your heart, your soul is able to rest. That's why we, I put my cell phone away, because I don't need that buzzing on my leg every morning, because I need some rest. Remember the things of God in our life. So with our third point, we ask ourselves some questions. These are some personal questions. Jesus says to them, yet I say to you that in this place, there is one greater than the temple. used to be that churches would have their st have a steeple on top of it. Nod your head if, if you remember churches having a steeple. Now churches are in malls and they're in convenient places. But the idea of a steeple used to be that the steeple pointed up, right? And the idea that this building is a building that points people back to God. And that's the, the, the purpose of a steeple. It's like, hey, when you come here, our job is to point you back to God. The Sabbath is to reflect on the things of God. And the temple was, again, to point people back to God. And Jesus is saying that one, the one who's speaking, the one who is here, the one who's in the midst is greater than the temple. The temple points you back to God. What Jesus is clearly saying to the Israelites, I want you to understand, is that Jesus is God. We have this phrase, and maybe you've heard it, the seven wonders of the world. Nod your head if you, re if you remember that. And it honestly started with the, the seven wonders of the ancient world. And what happened is, um, in old times, in Bible times, and even before, uh, they would build these great things as a reflection of how great they were as a people. So you have the pyramids, you have the... the Lighthouse of Alexandria, which would shine light and would remind people of 
the greatness of the Egyptians. You have the hanging gardens of Babylon. You have the, the temple of Zeus, or the statue of Zeus. You have the, the temple of Diana. And you'd have these people going, this is how great we are. Look at this building. Look at we've, what we've built. And for the Jews, they had the temple. The place where you could worship the one true God. One of the magnificent, one of the, the ancient wonders of the world. And just before this, in the, the generation prior, Herod the Great rebuilt the temple and expanded it and made it even much more magnificent as a reflection of his greatness, but also uh, for something that the people could take pride in. Like, hey, we are Israelites. Hey, we, we live in Jerusalem. Hey, we have the new and improved, the expanded, the, the wonder of the world. Look how awesome this building is. And Jesus is saying, I'm greater than that. And for us, it's a reminder of this. That Jesus is greater than the man-made things in our life. Because sometimes we trust in and we take pride in other things besides God. Sometimes we trust in the creation over the creator. Right? Sometimes we take comfort and we take pride in the fact that we're Americans. Right? We live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Right? We live in the greatest country ever to live. We have more wealth than has ever been created. We've, we've all heard these things, right? We have this great and mighty military. And yet, it's not America that saves us. It's Jesus that saves us, right? Sometimes we take pride in, in where we're from. Right? I'm a Philadelphian. Right? We have all the cool historical stuff in our country, right? We have the greatest sports teams in America. Now you're awake. <laughs> right? And Jesus is greater than all those things, right? Sometimes we take, you know, we trust in our retirement. Or we trust in the fact that we own a home and, and we have this stuff. Sometimes uh, we take pride in our, our collections. Like, look at all the, you know, Ninja Turtles I have or whatever y'all might collect. And sometimes it's easy to trust in things that are created and put our hope in those things as opposed to putting our hope in Jesus, the creator and the savior. And he's saying is, look, you trust too much in this building that points you to God, and God is right here. Look, sometimes we can trust in the wrong things as well. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And one of the things that we may have to reflect on in our life, do we really trust in Jesus or do we trust in the things that Jesus gives us? Second question is, what does Jesus want? Verse 7 is a, is a quote from Hosea 6.6. 6. Verse 7 reads, But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you have not condemned the guiltless. Jesus says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. The knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So in the Old Testament, if you did something wrong, you would come and you would offer a sacrifice, and you could be made right with God. And if you're not careful, you can play the spiritual game, right? Hey, I can do whatever I want. All I got to do is show up with the appropriate sacrifice, and God will forgive me. I can live what I want. As long as I sacrifice, I'm cool with God. And you know how to go through the games, go through the motions, but never give God obedience. Never know what God really wants from you. And by the way, if we're not careful... We can go through the spiritual game, can't we? We can show up to church and put our offering in the, in the box. We can know where the bulletins are located, when we're supposed to stand, and when we're supposed to sit. And if we get really brave, when the last at the pastor's jokes, and we can do all these things, and we can come back Sunday after Sunday and think, hey, I'm here, I give, 
I even help with the, the, the kids downstairs every once in a while. I must be good with God. And if we're not careful, we can make our own spiritual game and keep the rules that we want to keep. You know, for the Jews, you can offer, ask for forgiveness, but never give God obedience. The Pharisees can go through the game, and if we're not careful, we can go through our version of the game as well. That we can come, we can sing, we can listen. We can make up our own rules, but never really give God obedience. Remember the Sabbath day. The time to reflect, am I really drawing closer to Jesus, or am I just going through the motions? In this place, hopefully God can break through the noise and everything that we have going on in life, and hopefully God can speak to your heart. The last verse is perhaps the most tricky. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So who is Jesus is the first question. Right? Jesus is our Savior, that we trust Jesus, the creator over all the created things. What does Jesus want? He doesn't want us just to go through the motions, not just to play a spiritual game, not just to come, sit, go through our week, repeat. There's a phrase here, that we don't really use often. J is Jesus your Lord? Now, <coughs> it seems like we only use the word Lord in two different settings. We use it in church, and we use it in medieval England. Right? In medieval England, the idea, if you were a Lord, is this was a title. I would love to have a title like a Lord Jim or Lord Crosley. Wouldn't that be awesome? You can feel free to call me that if you want. I'll, just, I'll let that one slide. Charlotte's like, no. <laughs> we were down, I didn't bring this up in Sunday school, but uh, Sarah calls Abraham her master. And I was like, oh, I'm not touching that one. I'm just going to let that one slide. But in medieval England, in, you know, it was just after this that the King James Bible is translated. Uh, to be a lord would it be a, a ruler over an estate? Like this area of land, this section, this, this parcel, you could be lord of this. And sometimes, like the area of a lordship could be as big as like the area of a county in Pennsylvania. Like you could be lord of Adams County. And that would be pretty cool, right? You'd be lord of your county. That's a, that's a pretty big estate that you are the leader over, that you are the ruler over. Last week, if you were at the picnic, um, we asked the question, do you want Jesus or do you want the things of Jesus? Right? And the, to want Jesus is to have Jesus be the leader of your life. And the idea of a yoke is that, that Jesus is in control, that Jesus has the reins. The idea is that, that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. To be the Lord would be the leader. So the question is, what does Jesus want? Is Jesus the leader of your life? I said there's two places that we use the word Lord. We, we use it in medieval England, and we also use it sometimes in the church. And the phrase that we often use in the church is that we invite people to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Nod your head if you've heard that phrase before. Right? To make Jesus your Lord and... And it's interesting, the phrasing. We don't say, make Jesus your Savior and Lord. We actually say to people, we encourage them to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Because the idea of following Jesus isn't just praying a prayer and asking God for forgiveness, but you know, Romans 10, we start there. You know, that's the beginning of it. But that's just the beginning. That's not the end. What does Jesus want? Jesus wants to be your Lord. Jesus wants to be your leader. Jesus wants to have control. 
have the reins. Right? Because we'll, we'll say things like, God has a plan for us. Right? Well, if God has a plan for us, it's not we tell God what the plan is, but God has a plan for us. Who's the one leading or directing the idea of God's plan? It would be God, right? The creator of all the universe has a unique purpose, designed us with um, unique and special, and he has a plan specifically for your life. To understand God's plan is to yield control. Right? Is to put God first. Is to give God the reins. And follow God's leading in our lives. I mean, we want to have the reins and we want to go where we want to go and then we want God to bless that. And that's not how God works, right? If you're in Sunday school, this is the problem with Ishmael. Ishmael is the, the child of Abraham sinning. Abraham keeps going to God, hey God, why don't you just work this one out? And God's like, no, that's not how, it's not how it goes, right? So who is Jesus? He's the creator. What does he want? He doesn't want you just to go through the games. He wants a relationship with you that's real and personal. Well, how do I get that? It's first you have to confess Jesus as your Savior, but also you have to follow him as your Lord, allow him to be the leader of your life. The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. That the Sabbath wasn't created for us, but we are created to reflect on God on the Sabbath. So what is the purpose of the Sabbath day? The Pharisees were pointing fingers at Jesus going, look, you guys are all working. And they're like, we're just trying to get a snack. Like, this is crazy. It was never a call for laziness. It's a reminder that we are the more than the work of our hands. So in six days we do all the work, but on the seventh day we, we stop and we rest and we refocus and reflect on the things of God. What things, you know, how is our heart and how we love God and how is God's love seen through us and how we love one another? And the example Jesus gives about the Sabbath is people... Loving one another, the priest loving David, the priest loving the people who come to worship, our church, the, the nursery workers and the kids workers loving y'all. So, we ask you, who is Jesus in your life? Have you ever stopped and asked Jesus to be your Savior? And if you have, is Jesus actually the leader, the ruler, the Lord of your life? And you're like, I struggle with that, making him the leader. Like, I, I can say, God, take the rain, take the wheel, but so often I want to grip it back myself. You know, what's the one area of your life that I need to yield to Jesus? What's the area that you're taking the reins back? What's the area that you say, hey, you can have control, and then you, you wrestle it back from them? You know, what's that area in your life that you, yield to need, that you need to yield to the things of the Father? Okay, let's pray, and then we'll have a worship team come, and we'll sing our closing hymn together. God, sometimes it's easy to point fingers at others and not always examine our own heart. So here we are, Lord. Help us to say yes to you. Help us to yield to you. Help us to put you on the throne of our life. That in all our ways we acknowledge you and, Father, that you would direct our path. Help us to trust you, especially when it's hard. We ask these things in Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, stand and sing with us, our God. O oh God, our help in ages past.
glad that you could come this morning. Just a reminder, we have an open house. You could drop in 5.30 to 8. If you do, great. If you don't, well, that's okay too. Um, but we'd love to have you just stop by and enjoy our home with us for a few minutes. Um, so we'll pray and we'll be dismissed. God, we thank you for you are good. Your mercy is everlasting. God, we're so thankful that you formed us and that you know us and that you are with us. Lord, we desire not just to play the game, but to see you actually move and lead and be alive in our life and be alive in our home. And God, that we would be the example that our kids and our grandkids need to see. So Lord, here we are and we yield to you this day. Lord, be our Savior and also be our leader. In Jesus we ask. Amen.